You are listening to 90.3 WMSC off the campus of Montclair State University, Upper Montclair, New Jersey. I am Tara. This is my show, Stomp and Stroll Radio, where every Thursday we bring you the best ska, punk, and rock and roll. I am joined by one of my favorite human beings on the planet, who I've never met, songwriter, engine of Against Me, and the Devouring Mothers, and a solo artist, Laura Jane Grace. Hi, how you doing? I'm good. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Um, can I... Can I go ahead and share my Montclair, New Jersey connection with you? Absolutely, you can. Absolutely. My connection to Montclair, New Jersey is that my mother bought her wedding dress in Montclair, New Jersey. That's my connection to Montclair, New Jersey. That's so awesome. See, see, see it all comes back. It all <laughs> comes back to Jersey, you know, like everybody, everybody likes, you know, say stuff about Jersey, this Jersey, that it all comes back. <laughs> Well, Jersey is one of those places that's similar to Florida, which Florida is actually a very awesome place. Jersey is actually a very awesome place, right? People like to talk a lot of smack about Jersey, and they like to talk a lot of smack about Florida. And it's one of those places where if you are from there, you can join in and talk smack about it, right? But if someone who's not from there starts talking smack about it, there is no tolerance for that. Right. It's, it's like if, if, you're, if you're in then then it's okay it's like a sibling thing like you could say say whatever you want whenever you want exactly. if somebody else tries it exactly all bets are off the one time i've pl- i think it's the only time at least it was the first time the first time i played in montclair new jersey was also the very first time i met eric peterson who used to play as mischief brew and who is a very dear friend of mine who is no longer with us and i miss him constantly and again that connection to montclair uh, is special to me that's amazing i didn't realize you had you would have any connections to jersey that's cool though your new record at war with the silverfish dropped a couple days ago i got to listen to it it's amazing thank you it's a real different attitude to stay alive, I feel like. Yes, completely. Um, and like, there's a lot of different like sounds on it. I wasn't expecting, but were really, really cool to hear. Like, Lolo 13, the production is really different than anything on Stay Alive. There's a string section on Electrostatic Sweep, which is super cool. Did you have a goal or an inspiration going into those kind of sounds, or were you just making it up as you went? A little bit of both. You know, I mean, I was definitely making it up as I went along. Um, when it came to like writing the songs and recording the songs. Um, But then as it started to come together and as I realized like, oh, I I think I have like an EP here that that would be cool. Then like the overall vision was really pointed in that I didn't want it to be like stay alive. And, you know, stay alive is, is obviously like, uh, there's no metaphor in that title. You know, there, there shouldn't be anyone scratching their head being like, what are you trying to say? There's a pandemic going on in your albums called stay alive. Like, what do you mean by that? You know, while there are songs on stay alive that aren't necessarily, you know, just about the pandemic or anything like that, like it's a pandemic focused record and a year and a half into the pandemic, like, I just do not want to think about it because it's omnipresent, you know, like, and, and you, you can't escape it in so many ways and there's certainly nothing that like writing a song or putting out a record is going to solve with it you know um so i didn't want to kind of like posture like that or anything and and really was just like using kind of like surrealism as escapism in a way but not as in an unhealthy escapism type of way but you know just creating art when you don't know what else to do you know it's the first time in my life where that had really happened as far as like the way things usually go is you you write a record, you put out a record, and you go on tour for a year or two years playing shows, supporting that record. And then somewhere in that process, you're like, oh, yeah, I got to write more songs for the next record so we can continue doing this. But this time around, like after releasing Stay Alive, there, there was no touring. So it was immediately like, okay, I guess I'll just start or just keep writing songs and see where that gets me. But then, you know, also with this coming out now, there's the definite hope that we're we're somewhere on the coming out of this side. Maybe that's naive to think, you know, but but there's the definite hope that like, okay, well, next year at this time, you know, like, well, I, I really hope we're further along than we are now, you know, and things feel a lot better. And with that being said, like, I didn't want to do another release that was so tied to the pandemic in that way, because I don't know. I, I wanted something that was almost like, a, okay, now we can like, we'll make a fresh slate here. We'll, we'll do this thing that's kind of weird and exists in its own thing. And then from there after that can just do whatever I want. You know, there'll, there'll be no expectations. Right. I definitely see that with like, I mean, stay alive kind of felt like almost like a journal in a way it was real. Like, like you said, there was, there was, there were metaphors, but it wasn't like 
out there. It was very like, this is happening. This is what I'm feeling right here, right now, locked in my house again. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think it's cool that Silverfish kind of goes into, like you said, a different like writer e, if that makes sense. I think it's cool, and I think they're both phenomenal records. Thank you. Um, I mean, you brought it, you brought it up a little bit, but what's it been like doing like the releases for these albums, and then just having to kind of be there and watch? By the way the bathtub for stay alive <laughs> was the power play <laughs> um because you put up like uh, new things coming out i'm like okay cool check it out and it's just if, for those that don't know when the record stay alive came out in 2020 the debut was just you reading a book in a bathtub while the entire <laughs> record played that was the power play of album releases. <laughs> that's my that's my happiest place to be is in the bathtub. That's like my 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 refuge away from the world. More so than even my apartment. You know, like is is once I'm in the bathroom with the door closed and especially I love it so much during the winter where you know it gets so cold in Chicago and then drawing like a hot steaming bath and then open the opening the window so it becomes like a sauna inside the bathroom i love it um but you know polyvinyl had asked for some kind of thing to go along with the record for for the stream on on youtube since that was how it was going to premiere and originally they had proposed like chasing me with a drone and having me run for the whole length of the record because <laughs> i i'm an avid runner that's not totally out of the blue but i love running i, I try to go running every day the last time you ran in a music video was you getting chased and beaten up in the teenage anarchist <laughs> video <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, thank you. Well, actually, technically, uh, the video I did for the swimming pool song off of Stay Alive, I run in, which is funny because this, this Teenage Anarchist video came up. And like, I kind of when making the swimming pool song video was like butting heads with the director, maybe a little bit unintentionally. But I kept being like, hey, look, I've done a running video before. And these are the things I learned from it. Like we need to have marks of where we're running towards and like kind of time this out. I need to know what running speed I run at because like, look, I'm, you know, I'm supposed to be chasing this person in this video, but I run every day. I can run really fast. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be able to chase, catch them or like outrun them. So, uh, you know, we need to talk about this. And they were like, no, 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 no. You know, like trying to rush me along. Uh, but I used Teenage Anarchist as a reference and cause that was grueling. You know, that was a video shoot on Venice beach, where there was like, you know, a couple hundred bystanders watching each time we did a take for it. And we did like 30 takes. And that's 30 takes of me running from a fake cop and a fake cop tackling me, throwing me on the ground, and then me getting up and running and getting caught by another fake cop and thrown into the back of a cop car. Um, the next day I could like barely walk. My body was so bruised and battered, but super fun at the same time. So you're like, I know, I know how to do a running video. I've <laughs> yeah. done the running video. It sounds like I get, I, I was like, as I was saying, I was like, I know this sounds really pretentious to be like, look, I made a video in LA where I was running, you know, but I did. So like, you know, I have some expertise here. Maybe we could utilize that to make this go smoother. <laughs> it's, it's just the truth. <laughs> so what's it been like putting these two albums out then where you can't tour, you can't go out and do things. All you have is just like the music and the videos behind it. What's that experience been like for you? A little less satisfying, to be honest, in those ways. And, and, you know, I compare it to like what it was like working on a book where, you know, there's so much process involved and oftentimes the process is can be bleak, you know, where you're like waking up early in the morning and you're writing and you don't feel good. You don't feel like facing the world. You don't even get out of your whatever the clothes you slept in were that that night, you know, but there's usually that reward of you worked on this thing and then you put it out into the world and then you get to go and play a show, you know, and like everyone like can hear the songs and it's really visceral and really physical. But you put out a book, you spend all that time typing away on a computer and then you're finished and you just send it off and then that's it <laughs> you know and like as far as like yeah and then you have to like hope people like it or, or like have faith that people are reading it have faith that people are enjoying it and you hear feedback online or whatever but it's just way less immediate may le way less satisfying as as opposed to like all building to a, a concert or a tour you know right i feel like we we every like buddy who does like art um whatever that means for them has kind of had to come to terms with that musicians have we've had to do it here you know there was the whole year we were just doing stuff from home trying to be like yeah we're still alive and <laughs> that's it 
you can't come see us anywhere. We're not doing anything, but we're here. <laughs> I've seen a lot of people react with the, with the Stay Alive and with Silverfish. It's um, been cool. It's been positive. Yeah, I've I've definitely I've I've felt it. You know, and of of all the alternatives, of all the way to ways to approach it, this was the one that felt the best to me. In that, you know, even what I'm doing now, as far as like I have been out there playing a couple shows. You know, like I played I played in New Jersey in Garwood, New Jersey, two shows uh, or no one show in Garwood last month, and then. Um, three shows in Philadelphia, uh, made like a little week trip out of it. This past weekend, I played in Vegas and played a show in Chicago. And then um, next month, I have a show in New Hampshire and um, a show in Champaign, Illinois at the Polyvinyl headquarters. And so like, you know, a, a sporadic shows working back into it um, because I knew that it would be like this as far as like, you know, every band wants to be out on tour right now because they haven't been able to for a year and a half. And so also every band has been there sitting there working on a record that they're now going to put out because what else did they have to do? But consequently, you have things happening like, you know, it's almost a year turnaround to get vinyl pressed and then like clubs are booked up. So you have this total bottleneck effect in in those two areas, which are essential for for being in a band, you know, the manufacturing of record and venues. And if everyone is trying to start their cycle as a band now of put out a record, go on tour for a year or two years, then do it again and again. And we all say go and start now, then it's going it's to continue to be bottleneck. You know, you need to almost stagger it. So my strategy became just like, I'm just going to keep writing music and I'm going to keep recording music and I'm going to keep putting it out um, as I can get release dates with Polyvinyl behind them. And then as show opportunities come up, I'll go out and I'll play the shows. And then hopefully we'll get to a point where it's clear that it's not like a danger to book a tour. And then I'll book a tour and, and get back to hopefully some way how it used to be. But it's a lot easier to have to cancel one or two shows than it is to have to cancel like a month worth of shows. And after having to cancel a year worth of shows, pretty much um, having to cancel a month worth of shows would be devastating at this point. So just got to be careful moving back into it, you know? Yeah. And I think that's cool the way you've been able to like start, like you said, staggering it back in. You did one in Jersey that I missed. And then... <laughs> And then, <laughs> so one of the things that's been brutal over the past, like, especially last year was the remnants of, I don't even want to say his name, former authority figure. No idea who you're talking about. Could no. be anybody, you know <laughs> what I mean? Oh, um, yeah. Keeping it real vague and um, they don't call me Tara plausible deniability Chiquetti for nothing. <laughs> but not only did that happen, right? The show after you played in Jersey at the Four Seasons landscaping. I did, yes. <laughs> Why and how did that go? I want all the details on that. Okay, so Four Seasons Total Landscaping, made famous by that Rudy Giuliani press conference, the absolutely insane, nightmarish Rudy Giuliani press conference. You know, playing a show there I honestly left me with more questions than it did answers as to how the Giuliani thing happened there. But that being said, it was a really good show and a really positive energy with the crowd there. And um, it kind of seemed like a once in a lifetime opportunity in that way, where the credit for the idea goes to Dave Kiss, who is a Philadelphia promoter, and to Toby Jegg, who um, is a mutual friend of me and Brendan Kelly. Brendan also played that show at Four Seasons. And he was doing a tour with Brendan and Dave in Philadelphia was like, hey, I have the perfect venue for a show, but it needs to be more special. We need to make it more of an event. So the idea was raised to ask me to come out and play the show as well. And Dave was into that and it happened, you know, uh, but it was exactly what it was as far as like we played in a landscaping parking lot, <laughs> you know, like it's funny because like oftentimes on tour in the UK or Europe specifically, there'll be this thing that happens called disco loadout where like you'll have your show. But the promoter and the venue are like, you got to be out of the venue like 30 minutes after you play because there's a disco night. There's a club night happening in the in, in the venue. Well, so this wasn't exactly disco loadout. This was landscaping loadout where like as soon as we were done with the show, you could tell they wanted us to leave because they had to get back to being landscapers. Like, you know, they're like pulling out the lawnmowers and all their gear and stuff, you know. But, um, you know, it was a good vibe. And, and also um, 
it was an outside show. So one of the first shows back as far as like comfortability as opposed to being crammed into a club, you know, like it was nice to be outside really. Somebody described it on socials I saw as that show and you specifically were like stage to the four seasons total landscaping, just like a complete change of energy. I almost said at the venue, but it's not a venue. It's a landscape. <laughs> yeah, that's, right. That's <laughs> Well, that's what, you know, that's what I mean as far as like leaving more questions than answers where I understood after being there, I understood where the Four Seasons people were coming from with letting the Giuliani thing happen. They weren't necessarily Trump supporters. They weren't necessarily Biden supporters. They were just like impressed with the novelty that the then president's people had contacted them and been like, we want to use your landscaping company for this event. And they're like, uh, okay. You know, and I'm sure they got some money for it. Right. So I get that. That all makes sense. That checks out. But being there in person and seeing it, like, I do not understand how no one, no one on Giuliani's team when they showed up was like, oh, this is a bad idea because there's no denying what it is when you show up there. There's no fooling yourself. It's a landscaping company. It's just a yard, a chained in yard behind a landscaping company business. So, and I know that, you know, his entourage, Giuliani, Giuliani's entourage was probably a couple hundred people deep between like, you know, uh, associates and secret service people who all had to vet it too. And the idea that no one was like, uh, sir, this is uh, not good. This is not the Four Seasons Hotel. Nobody was like, this isn't the look chief. Yeah, yeah. And, and you'd think, too, that if it was someone's mess up, they would have been fired. And then you would have seen them on whatever news shows afterwards, giving their interviews, talking about how they used to work for Giuliani and then they got fired because of this and, you know, divulging whatever other secrets or, or t talking whatever other trash, you know, but none of that happened. So it, it just really doesn't make any sense to me still. It's a mystery. I give it a year. <laughs> I give it a year, another year probably before the next election cycle starts, which I'm dreading before the books start. I think everybody's going to have a book. Like Chris Christie got a book. Giuliani's going to have, everybody's going to have a book and <laughs> like, Oh, everything was so weird and I didn't like it, but I stayed there anyway. Like it's going to be that for like a year. That's my prediction. <laughs> so one of the other cool thing about stay alive and silverfish and a lot of the stuff, you know, happening now is that, what we feel here at like WMSC a lot is that there's this kind of like change in how people get everything. You know, it's like, like it's really interesting to see that like music discovery is coming from so many different places. Like it's happening here on our station and it's happening on like TikTok. So I'm curious, if, what's your experience with college radio been like? I'm a fan of college radio. I like college radio so much more than I do uh, terrestrial radio. You know, it seems like college radio is the one place where the ability for actual DJs to play what they actually want to play still kind of exists as opposed to, I was, I was actually joking about it this morning on Twitter where uh, I had to drive my daughter to school this morning and it's only like seven miles, but it took me two hours this morning to drive to school. And I'm sitting there listening to Chicago's, you know, whatever number one rock alternative station. And they play that jet song. Uh, Are you going to be my girl? You know, that song is terrible. And it's also and I, like, what, how many years old is that? <laughs> Well, right. And that's where it's like, yo, is there a single person on this planet who woke up this morning and was like, you know what I really want to hear? Uh, jets. Are you going to be my girl? No, no, no. Not Iggy Pop's Lust for Life. I want to hear Jets. Are you going to be my girl? No okay. one. No Real one quick. Hear that thank again. you so <laughs> much for pointing out that those two songs are basically the same. They are. Well, and that's it. And it's like you listen hearing that Jet song. It's like. There's so many songs like that from the 90s or early 2000s where it's like, enough, enough. These songs have been played enough. No one needs to hear them anymore. We do not need to hear Collective Souls shine ever again. Just ever again. No one needs to hear it. It has been played to its quota. Or similar like Marcy Playground songs or whatever those like or weird holdover songs that like just continually get airplay when it's like there are so many great bands out there that have a happened since or that are happening now 
I've been doing this like once a, once a month DJ gig for House of Vans or for Vans. Excuse me. I set the parameters for my show of like I only want to play new music, only stuff released pre post 2020, 2020 and beyond. Nothing pre pandemic. So it's been a cool challenge every month having to come up with two hours worth of music that's all new to play. But at the same time, like, you know, gives lends the platform then to the bands that are out there in existence now that would, I'm sure, be lo love to be out there on the road touring. Um, and then, you know, I don't know, just hopefully shares new music, you know? Yeah, that's totally, that's, that's our, like, mission statement, you know? Like, there's so many amazing, even in, like, the genres that people wouldn't think are at the cutting edge. Like, I talked to Reed from We Are The Union. Right. They're a brand new ska punk band and they're amazing. Or like Meet Me at the Altar does this like really cool pop punk, easy core, like breakdown heavy thing. They're amazing. Pink Shift is amazing. There's so much cool stuff happening. It just give it a chance, you know? Yeah, I really, I don't have a lot of respect for people who take the attitude of like, oh, there's no good music out there now. It's like, no, you're just lazy. Like, yep. <laughs> all it is, you know? Like, that's so cool. Like, that we could do stuff like that. So I'm really glad you said that because that's literally our mission statement. Right um, if you're just tuning in, my name is Tara. I am your free gift with Purchase with Stomp and Stroll Radio. I'm talking to Laura Jane Grace from Against Me. Uh, whose album at war with the silverfish just came out i'm starting college radio day if i could play any song what would you um what would you like me to play any song if if you can play any song my request for tomorrow you should play a giant toy dogs or, or you should play a, a giant dog song you should play um do you know the band a giant dog not familiar okay a giant dog is gonna blow your mind my two favorite albums of theirs are toy and pile uh, i would like to hear a song off of pile i think you should play the song sex and drugs or no and rock and roll mm, one of those either play the song sex and drugs or play the song and rock and roll they're fantastic <laughs> they they are the best punk band in existence right now in my opinion i mean I'm biased. I think Against Me is the best punk band in existence, <laughs> but again, super biased. So <laughs> thank you. That's awesome. What's next for you and where can people find it if they want to check out what you're doing? Um, shows for the rest of the year, you know, like just a, a couple of shows each month. Um, and then we'll see what happens in 2022, but I'll keep working on songs, keep working on music and definitely be busy. And if anyone is interested in checking out what I'm doing, um, you know, I have, I'm, I'm on all social medias, uh, just at Laura Jane Grace. And uh, I have a website, although I don't know if anyone's ever gone to my website, laurajanegrace.com, but, um, you know, available on all streaming services too. Or if you want the physical, uh, you can pre-order the new EP from Polyvinyl Records. And um, yeah. Laura, thank you so much for talking to us. This is Stomp and Stroll Radio on 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair.